As uh, live participants start streaming here, I want to say welcome. Uh, this is uh, Meng, the John Everson Dean of College of Engineering at Purdue. Uh, and uh, we have a very special uh, monthly virtual fireside with alum and also uh, an event with an outstanding group of colleagues, uh, Neil Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Fellows to Purdue Engineering. And I will turn the mic over to uh, Armin, who uh, was the mind behind the creation of this program to introduce the panelist. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Meng. Uh, back in 2019, we celebrated 50 years since Purdue Engineering alumnus Neil Armstrong's one small step inspired the entire world about the limitlessness of human and technological achievement. And in that year, Purdue Engineering was really proud to launch this program to bring uh, highly accomplished and world-recognized scholars and practitioners uh, to Purdue Engineering uh, to really collaborate and catalyze uh, interactions that would increase the visibility and impact of our students, uh, faculty, schools, and college. I'm uh, really delighted that uh, today, uh, five out of uh, seven of our Neil Armstrong Distinguished uh, Visiting Professors are able to join us for this panel, and I'd like to do a brief introduction uh, of them. As I read your names, just please who worked at Lockheed Martin from 1985 to 2011 in many different technical leadership um, roles and is world renowned for inventing the vertical lift concept in the F-35 JSF Joint Strike Fighter. Um, he's a member of the NAE, a fellow of the AIAA. He's the recipient of several awards, including AIAA's Newbold VSTOL and Aircraft Design Awards and the Daniel Guggenheim Medal. Uh, Lockheed Martin's Kelly Johnson's uh, Inventors uh, Awards and the Aerostar and Nova Award, SAE's Aerospace Vehicle Design and Development Award and the Amer American Helicopter Society's Polly Heuter Award. And he was recognized as Engineer of the Year by Design News Magazine in 2004. Um, Paul is working with the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics in many topics, including aerodynamics and uh, new concepts in aircraft design. Welcome, Paul. Thank you. Dara Intakabi uh, is the Bacardi and Stockholm Water Foundation professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and professor in the Department of Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at MIT. He's an expert in hydrological remote sensing and is currently the science team leader for NASA soil mission, soil moisture, active passive mission. He's a member of the NAE and a fellow of the IEEE, the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. Uh, and uh, Dara is working in the School of Aeronautics and Astronautics as well, uh, really on new remote sensing techniques for soil and water, in particular, the use of signals of opportunity in the P-band below 400 megahertz. Welcome, Dara. Thank you. Also joining us today is Enrique Iglesia, who is the Theodore Fermilin Professor in Chemical Engineering at UC Berkeley. His research addresses the design and synthesis of structural and mechanistic characterization of inorganic solids used as catalysts for chemical reactions that are important in the production, conversion, and use of energy carriers in sustainable petrochemical syntheses and in the protection of the environment. He's a member of NAE, uh, AAAS, and the National Academy of Inventors. He's received several awards for his contributions to chemistry and chemical engineering. Most recently, he received the 2019 Michael Budert Award for advancement in catalysis and the AICHE, uh, AICHE's William Walker Award for Excellence and Contributions to Chemical Engineering Literature. Uh, uh, Enrique is working with faculty and students in, in CSTAR, which is our Center for Innovative and Strategic Transformation of Alkane Resources Center uh, on research, on industry innovation, entrepreneurship, and educational activities. Welcome, Enrique. Thank you. Also joining us today is uh, Randall Poston. Uh, Dr. Poston is Senior Principal at Pivot Engineers, a structural engineering consulting firm in Austin, Texas. He's an internationally recognized expert in structural engineering practice. And he's an inductee in the National Academy of Engineering as well. Uh, Randy has established himself as one of the preeminent structural consultants in the United States and has authored and delivered hundreds of papers and presentations related to the structural engineering industry. 
He's championed the repair of existing structures for upwards of 30 years and dedicated his career to advancing the state of structural engineering knowledge. He was the past chair of the American Concrete Institute's Committee 318 Structural Building Code, where he oversaw a monumental effort to completely reorganize the concrete code, the first undertaking of its time uh, of its kind in the history of ACI. The engineering news record ENR named him a top 25 newspaker in 2014 for his code reorganization leadership and ACI bestowed upon him the Henry L. Kennedy Award for his work. Uh, Randy is working with faculty and students in the Lyle School of Civil Engineering uh, in the area of structural engineering. Uh, welcome, welcome Randy. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Mordecai Moti Segev is the Robert Shulman Distinguished Professor of Physics and Electrical Engineering at the Technion in Israel, where he received his BSc and PhD as well. After postdocing at Caltech, he joined Princeton, where he rose through the ranks very quickly uh, from assistant to full professor uh, before being recruited back as Distinguished Professor at Technion in 2009. Moti's interests are mainly in photonics, solitons, lasers, and quantum optics. Uh, these are topics with which he's collaborating with faculty in electrical and computer engineering here at Purdue, but also in physics. He has won numerous international awards, amongst them the 2007 Quantum Electronics Prize of the European Physics Society, the 2009 Max Born Award of the OSA, and the 2014 Arthur Shalow Prize of the APS. In 2011, uh, he was elected to the Israel Academy of Sciences. In 2015, to the National Academy of Science in the US, and in 2021 to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, AAAS. In 2014, Moti won the Israel Prize, which is the highest uh, honor in Israel. And in 2019, he won the EMET Prize. Above all his achievements, uh, Moti takes pride in the success of his graduate students and postdocs. Among them, there are 23 who are professors in the US, Germany, Taiwan, Croatia, Italy, India, China, and Israel many hold senior R&D positions in industry. Welcome, Moti. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. And uh, moderating our Farsight chat today is uh, my boss, uh, uh, Meng Chiang, the John A. Edwardson Dean, the College of Engineering, <laughs> and the Roscoe George Distinguished Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Over to you, Meng. Thank you so much, Armin. Uh, just one minor correction. On, I'm no one's boss. I assure you, no one uh, <laughs> thinks of me as uh, their boss. Uh, now, uh, it's, uh, however, a great pleasure to be here in the same virtual room as our five uh, Neil Armstrong Distinguished Visiting Professors here uh, at Purdue Engineering. And as you can tell, that uh, this is truly an, an incredibly talented group. Uh, and thank you for sparing some time every year visiting us uh, at Purdue and working with our faculty and students here. Um, and you represent quite a cross section of different engineering disciplines and also from different parts of the country and the world. So to those who are watching real time, uh, you can also ask questions uh, in the chat box, although I've already uh, generated quite a few uh, to start out with. And those who are watching uh, later uh, asynchronously, um, you know, feel free to uh, reach out to these uh, incredible uh, researchers uh, with your additional questions. Well, the theme here today is looking at the virtual physical interface and how that's going to address the education research societal challenges. Well, uh, maybe I'll just spend one minute uh, uh, giving my biased view on what I mean by this virtual physical interface here. Uh, so if you think about what we code and what we touch, uh, they increasingly interact with each other. One form of interaction is uh, I want to run physical experiment at the uh, uh, wind tunnel and I want to extract a mathematical representation from it. Another could be that I got uh, remote sensing in the building, outside the building, and uh, uh, the interactions is uh, physical, but the way that I design the interaction uh, relies on uh, software, relies on codes. Another one could be you know, look at autonomy as uh, a standard example today that uh, you've got uh, softwares driving the car uh, in some sense. Uh, so you've got an autonomous, connected, uh, almost <laughs> intelligent 
thing driven by machine learning, driven by software engineering, uh, but they are driving physical objects. They are moving sometimes physical, dangerous, heavy or light physical objects. So that decisioning and control interaction in real time is another type of interface. Now, uh, the first question is a generic one, and you know, I will give that to all the panelists, is what do you think, whether it's in your own area or neighboring disciplines, is the most critical or um, interesting kind of interactions between uh, the bytes and the atoms or between uh, the virtual and the physical worlds. And uh, with five panelists, you know, uh, maybe I'll start out uh, just uh, sort of uh, first name alphabetically, if you will, you know, start out with uh, Dara uh, and then Enrique and then uh, 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 Marty and Paul and Randall. Um, please. Hey. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you uh, for this uh, panel and really a pleasure to be here. I think in, in, in my field, actually, the use of the virtual world um, was early on one of the problems in computer science. You know, numerical weather forecast um, was something that was one of the early benchmark sort of virtual world applications. And uh, this is going back to 1950s in Princeton, actually, but uh, it it hasn't th throughout all these years. It hasn't uh, made experimentation and physical um, um, representations of processes obsolete at all. It has made them all the more necessary. So it's not like uh, one is replacing the other, but just expanding the capability and creating new problems to be solved, in a sense. So, um, you know, I think the micro weather forecast is a, is a good example of how early on the virtual was adopted and it's part, it's a necessary arm in, in that, you know, aviation without weather forecast would be a very dangerous thing. Yes. Yep. Thank you, Dara. And Enrique, please. So if, if I divide my, my discipline into three components, one of them is the chemistry component, one of them is the engineering component, and the other one is the classroom. Um, and if I may speak briefly about each one of them, um, I think that would make it fairly complete. So when it comes to the chemistry part of chemical engineering and what we do in rearranging molecules, yeah, clearly the advances have come from being able to describe the motion of electrons and their positions using equations that are too difficult to solve and as a result of it have become increasingly less approximate and increasingly more visual. The ability to think in multidimensional space, since every vibrational mode of a molecule is actually a potential reaction coordinate, is something that, that humans are not able to visualize, but machines are able to provide for us at least a final answer. And perhaps in the less chemical end of things and more physical, I think the protein folding problem is a classical example of how it is that machines with some learning capability are able to now solve problems that were not solvable before. In the engineering side of what I do, um, I think the, um, the machines have for a long time allowed us to interact with processes in ways that allow us to sense things that we cannot see detect problems that we would not otherwise detect and act on those problems with remedies that lie supported by a model that tells you what to do when something happens. Uh, a lot of that has been moved to the virtual side as a result of the fact that safety concerns associated with operational chemical processes um, are best handled from a distance, okay? And I think today for the most part, most of the operators of those chemical processes are trained with the, the moral equivalent of a flight simulator in order to be able to detect problems in silico so that when they happen in practice, they know what to do. When it comes to the classroom, and this is a conversation that perhaps we will return to, but when it comes to the classroom, I think the, the recent emergencies that we have faced have made it clear that we can deliver information 
to more people more efficiently as a result of our ability to communicate over distances and uh, over different times by recording, by talking to large audiences, such as the ones that we have gathered here today. What in my view has not happened in my classroom is that I think the recipients of the information have not really adapted to how to absorb knowledge that comes in a remote form. And if there's time, that's a subject that is dear to my heart. And if the conversation leads us there, I think that there is an untraining of humans that needs to take place before we can accept knowledge that comes in a different mode and without the social component of human interactions. Uh, thank you, Enrique. We'll come back to some of those points. And Marty, please. Well, I want to go back uh, in history of science, 40 years, early 80s. Uh, Richard Feynman, already Nobel laureate, this is like about 10 years or so before he passed away, uh, realized that there are several models, actually many models of physical processes and materials that we assume that we, we think we know the equations, but we can't solve them. And the whole classical, all the computing power on earth together, taken together, cannot solve them because these problems diverge. And it may take them thousands or millions of years or so to solve. Some of these problems actually uh, also we know from day-to-day -day life, like for example, this uh, uh, traveling salesman and so forth, optimization problems. So Richard Feynman suggested at that time to do a quantum simulator, which is like a special purpose quantum computer. For some years, people really didn't really consider that seriously, but now everybody is talking about quantum computers. So I'd like to talk about those, really the ability to compute processes that we think we know the equations and we can't solve. There are so many uh, effects and phenomena in, in the physical world around us and also in engineering applications that we would like to be able to compute. So obviously we are facing a major challenge. There are many companies and, and countries that are involved in this business. The bottom line is that uh, if uh, 10 years ago, I thought that maybe we are near a quantum computer. Now we think that we are still looking at a real quantum computer about 10 years away. But now let's imagine that we have one, which we don't. And I am, I am happy to provoke IBM and Google and many others, and we don't have a real useful quantum computer that can do something that, that is really important, not only breaking codes for national security or something, but for example, computing uh, some uh, molecules so we can design better drugs for personalized medicine, for example. They can't do it today, okay? And uh, so I'm happy to, to challenge any of one of these that will tell us that we'll have it in a year or two. I can tell you that it's not so, it's not so coming in the near future. But this is where I think this... Uh, the major challenge is going, and I think we are going there more and more. I think we will have one, we will have, but it's not as near as people think. And I think it gets our uh, imagination quite excited to be able to understand the world around us and also use it. Uh, the uh, designing better drugs is just one example out of very many. I think uh, Dara talked about weather forecast. This is another problem of this kind that uh, a, a quantum computer would be able to simulate better. Will it solve it? I don't think so, <laughs> at least uh, because the, yeah, there, there are several arguments why probably not, because it's a chaotic system, at least sometimes. But there's a lot to do and uh, major challenges for the next generation. Yep. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, and Paul, please. Yeah. Um... For us in soft in the uh, aerospace field, you know, 50 years ago there was no software on airplanes. The uh, F-16 was unstable in pitch and had fly-by-wire. It had it like 250,000 lines of software code. But today the Dreamliner and the Joint Strike Fighter have over five million lines. In fact, they both programs ran into problems um, in developing the software. So it's become very important. And we joke in the industry that the airframe is a dust mix in software. So for us, um, the interactions uh, between software and uh, simulation involve uh, airplanes that are pretty well defined. I mean, a jet airplane looks like a Boeing 707 
transport airplane looks like a C-130. But if you're doing something completely new, like the stealth F-117, you can't really rely on software. And our philosophy there is you do enough with the software to make sure you haven't got a dumb idea. And then you go to rapid prototyping and you test it. And in fact, that's part of the scientific method, isn't it? I mean, how something, a hypothesis moves to a theory is you predict something that no one's seen before. And then you go out and see if you find it. And if you find enough times, it becomes a theory. So there's a important interaction between theory and experiment. And I could go into, and perhaps I will in later questions, a lot of examples in our field where we thought we had the answer and um, we neglected an effect or a term and we were completely wrong about it. Yep, well, thank you. We'll come back perhaps to some of those very telling examples, uh, Paul. And uh, Randall, please. Yeah, I, I, several things come to, come to mind in hearing uh, the various uh, panelists talk. And certainly in my, my world as I'm really a practicing uh, engineer, structural engineer or civil engineer, uh, dealing with uh, with infrastructure, so it's you know very physical sorts of of, of things, uh, and not. Uh, uh, but we do rely heavily on uh, you know computerization and and, and software. I, I look back on on my career, and uh, similar to what uh, Paul was saying, we barely had uh, uh, you know computer analysis that we could do and use for structural analysis and the like. And now it's. Uh, you know, basically, you build a model and visualize it. Visualize the uh, the, uh, the 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 forces and the stresses that are in in the model in order to do your uh, you know invest do your investigation or do your design. So I'm 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 of the belief too that uh, you know it's it's a tool to help advance our our knowledge and our in our uh, in our building. Uh, you uh, you know this the important part to me is whatever simulation or analysis you're doing has to be a an accurate representation of of the of the physical so you need somehow to tie the simulations back to uh, reality and whether that's from physical models uh, from prototypes uh, to experiments in the in the laboratory i think that's a that's an absolute uh, must at least in 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 our field Yes. Well, thank you so much, everyone. You know, uh, I want to follow up on this the theme on the classroom and the uh, education uh, in engineering. And I'll ask two uh, related questions. One is, uh, we see that a lot of engineering students, not as much at Purdue, perhaps, but uh, uh, I have heard uh, at peer institutions, public and private, other top uh, schools, where engineering students are leaving the physical side. Uh, of the degree choices and uh, crowding into uh, a lot in computer science or uh, data science or AI degrees. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, is there a competitive job market you see out there or anything that can be done uh, to give uh, these students a balanced set of choices? Uh, I'm not uh, questioning their rational decision making ability. I'm just simply saying as a, educators, you know, to give them truly a well informed decision process uh, and giving give them the uh, range of choices. You know, I'll give one example in the semiconductors. You know, we see that uh, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are going to be spent this decade in the US and some other places to build new fabs. Uh, some of the fabs will require BS or MS, if not PhD level, uh, uh, the engineers to work in them. Uh, but just getting students to be interested in taking semiconductor courses. Uh, we are rolling out a whole set of dedicated degrees from Purdue next month, uh, nation's first, uh, I think. Uh, but it's one thing for us to offer it. Uh, it's another for them to be interested, even when there seems to be a pretty good labor market. Maybe I don't know how well they pay compared to uh, jobs on programming for AI applications. So any thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a huge labor market out there. One of our big problems on the Joint Strike Fighter was hiring enough software engineers who wanted to come from the gaming companies, the video companies, et cetera, to, to work in aerospace. They didn't realize that there was jobs for software engineers in aerospace. So there's a huge demand for them. They're 
lots of jobs they can do with the artificial intelligence in the automobile industry. Um, so I think the students are aware of that and that's why they're going into software engineering. But mm -hmm. our problem is, is letting them know that there's software engineering to be done in the other fields. Mm -hmm. Civil engineering, mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Paul. Anyone? Anyone else? Uh, you know, I've heard of some fellow deans of top schools uh, sort of uh, uh, wondering whether uh, they are seeing this trend towards uh, a ginormous percentage of engineering students into computer science. Whereas the degrees uh, such as electrical or chemical or civil, mechanical, aero, and so on, um, our aero may be slightly different uh, just because there's a lot of uh, uh, very hot news out there around aero and astro. But uh, a lot of the fields, they're looking at the number of BS degree uh, enrollment is uh, shrinking. Again, I want to qualify at Purdue Engineering, that's really not. To, uh, the phenomena we're looking at shrinkage, no, uh, quite the opposite. But in many other places, uh, they see that you can add up all the other engineering degree BS uh, enrollment, and they're still smaller than uh, the enrollment in CS. Maybe that's just the way it's going to be. Uh, I'm not saying it's not healthy, but just wondering about your thoughts. Well, if if you find that there are any schools out there that need more chemical engineers, UC Berkeley is happy to provide some because our enrollments are continuously increased for the last five years. Um, chemical engineers have a, a, a well-deserved reputation for claiming that they can do anything, including software engineering, if they're called upon doing it. Uh, but we do take a, a certain position that, that we tend to be two users rather than two makers. And in that sense, I think that at least from the way that we train our students, we clearly have to bring back the, the logic of programming that now is done by numerical packages. We need to teach them again how to write a logic diagram because it will help them not only in writing software, but also in reasoning through complex problems in a logical way. So my feeling is that in spite of the data science that today attracts many of the um, younger members of the engineering uh, community, that at the end is going to be the ability to use statistics, probability, to be able to know the logic of programming that is ultimately going to lead them to be able to apply the algorithms as they're written, to do machine learning, artificial intelligence, without ever having to become the ones that actually develop the software and the hardware to be able to do it. So I view it as a return to my roots to some extent, because that is a way that chemical engineering was taught 40 years ago, okay? When we had to program in C or Fortran, for example, we didn't have a package like MATLAB to be able to do it. And we took a course in statistics and probability that served us well, well outside anything that had to do with data. So I don't think that at least in, in my discipline, we have to worry about a an exodus, okay, into the more uh, glamorous areas today. Okay, yeah, thank you, Enrique. And Dara, uh, you've got yeah. your hand up. Yeah, um, the current um, market trends and um, in, in data science and AI among students may continue, it may saturate, it, it may be that the, the new equilibrium is gonna be that the majority of students are in that field. But it also depends on their ambition. Is is the creative process? What is it that you're applying? What is the innovation that you're trying to apply um, data science to? Is the idea of the app not coding the app, which is the uh, issue, and that goes. Where do creative ideas come from? Um, is it? Can it be acquired purely by virtual education or does it require a culture and a, a, a incubation space like a university campus? And also that means that the sort of physical sciences like chemical engineering, civil engineering, biology and all that have to persist with some level of activity because that's where the problems come from. It's not just coding, it's coding what? 
-hmm. And also it goes into the universities uh, using uh, the, the fact that there's all disciplines, social sciences, history, and how do those inspire creative ideas? How do those get engaged? It's not, um, yep. it's not just social science requirements, it's where ideas come from. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to follow up on that. And I know there are also audience questions in real time streaming in, but uh, Marty uh, uh, has a point. Yeah. One. So I think that in terms of undergraduate education, uh, AI is going to be uh, very big, certainly in the next decade, maybe also after that, maybe it will stay like that for tens of years. But for PhD, I think uh, the ideas need to come from the physical or, or, or world. Okay. There is a limit to how much you can come up with just by uh, uh, doing working with software or even working with mathematics. Everything else comes from the physical world. And I think that for in terms of the level of the PhDs, we will still have them more or less uniformly distributed, maybe slightly larger in AI. The undergraduate uh, population will still will go to AI simply because they pay more. If you look at what happens now, in, for example, at the salaries that uh, undergraduate uh, students, just the ju or those that just graduated or about to graduate, they get offers from companies like uh, Facebook and uh, Google and uh, all kinds of others, uh, smaller companies that are at the level of a senior engineer in the industry and in, in all other kinds of disciplines, okay? Including in very competitive ones like photonics and quantum and so forth. Still, the Facebook kids get more. So that I think will continue to drive the undergraduate world. But for PhD, I think uh, yes. for research, there's still going to be always, I think, a more or less uh, distributed as it is today. Now, I want to point here to another thing, which is also very interesting. It turns out that today, a lot of the uh, cutting edge research, not development, the true research is done in the industry, in places like Facebook. Uh, it's hard for us to swallow, hard for us to admit, because when we think back, the research at uh, Bell Laboratories, for example, the, the mythical place, this is like the ideas factory, if you know that book that tells us about how the transistor was invented, the laser and satellite communication and so forth. Uh, at that time, this was like a, people viewed it as the world's lab. Today, these are private companies, actually. And, uh, and the, really the research, the cutting edge research is done there, not at MIT, maybe also at MIT and places like that. But first of all, at places like, like Facebook, as much as we wouldn't, it's hard well, for us to swallow. You know, yes, Facebook, Google, MIT, and Purdue. Uh, now, uh, I will come back later okay. to, to, to this point <laughs> right, to have time, but let, let me go back to this um, uh, point already raised by some of the panelists uh, repeatedly, and that is, uh, you know, if I flip the question here and say, what about making either basic programming skills or the mindset of software engineering, right, as a way to create, as a way to do problem solving, uh, as a required general education? So now these are two distinct things. The ability to code and the way of thinking as a coder are not identical uh, objects, but, you know, maybe either or both. Uh, as a gen ed, uh, as we call it here in the U.S. system, uh, just like you have to take a minimum number of courses in history or foreign language, uh, every student, right, uh, including uh, uh, sociology majors. Uh, now, uh, a sort of related sub-question would be in engineering, we can make it uh, sort of a required. Uh, I'll give you two quick examples. One is that we started something called uh, Every Border Engineer Codes, is uh, EBEC. Uh, what it does is is a non-transcripted, non-credit course on Saturdays, Saturday mornings, to offer to students, uh, and it won't even show up on your transcript, and you may pass and get a certificate. Well, we grew from 50 students taught by students to this year, 2,000 students in one year. Took the biggest class at Purdue Engineering is not a class. Uh, not officially recognized or transcripted class. We're also rolling out the coming year as an AI minor 
which is offered to all the engineering majors. So you can be a major in civil or chemical, any engineering, and take a minor in in AI. So you know uh, we are trying to see if there's the best of both worlds here. But back to my question to the pan all panelists is, uh, what do you think about making uh, programming like a uh, basic understanding of history and language, general education requirement for all college students, say at Purdue. So since since I brought it up, let me let me make the, the first comment on it. And in, and to me, the, the logic of programming, the, the reasoning that goes behind it, the, the tenets and the tools of statistics and probability, that is part of an education. That is part of what you keep at some point in time when you're not coding anymore and you're not doing experimental design of experiments. And I, I distinguish that from what I would call, um, not despairingly, vocational training, which is training people how to put those to the solution of a particular problem, the coding of a particular exercise, or the analysis of a particular data set. And, and I do put it in the same general education category, both the ability to the logic of coding and statistics and probability to be part of a general education in much the same way as the humanities are. And then the training on how to apply to specific problems, that is something that is local, that the students are going to need, but they're not going to take away the particular problem on the particular code, but what we taught them about making connections as a result of those general courses. Yeah, I want to add to that, that I, li I like to make a distinction between programming or coding and software engineering. Coding is what an undergraduate does. He's given an assignment and he's to write a program. But software engineering says, well, what does the customer want? What's the need? What are the requirements? How did I turn that into a program? And that's uh, what's really important. I mean, it's like teaching someone to run a computer language to to learn a computer language that language is going to be obsolete eventually yep. but computer coding or software engineering is going to persist and that's what they need to really learn yes the other comment i'd like to make is students seem to believe the codes more than the experiment they uh they pick up a number from a code and they don't have any reason to no, no practical experience to say this is wrong it can't be right they seem to say it came out of a computer program, so it must be right. Just like if you find it on the internet, it must be right. <laughs> yes. Thank you for highlighting the differentiation between uh, a vocational training of a skill of operating in one particular language uh, versus the mindset, including the ability to uh, not blindly trust code. Uh, yeah, I, so, but I assume that you, you are implying that if this is the mindset we're talking about, maybe part of the mindset training is through a concrete programming language uh, in some uh, steps. It should become a general education requirement for anyone to graduate from a college. Which language, though? Right. That may, again, change over time, right? But. Uh, uh, that will be purely used as a tool, as a vehicle to deliver the educational outcome of training the mindset. Right? So if that's the case, uh, the end goal now being get them to be uh, uh, expert in one particular language, uh, I assume some of the panelists are implying that they would be supportive of making that a, a general education requirement, even for history majors. Uh, well, I see Marty and Randall's uh, hands up, please. Yeah, yeah. Marty, you can go first if you okay. like. So uh, let me first answer the question. In my opinion, yes. In my opinion, this is like mathematics in, in uh, elementary school. We will have to teach everyone to have uh, some basic uh, coding skills to write a computer program and to do a flowchart and understand what it means. Just like we required everybody will know some basic operation in mathematics in elementary school. And in my opinion, at some point, it will go down to elementary school for all the kids. And they will learn it maybe a third or fourth grade to know something about this. 
this will also maybe make uh, many people that today you try to teach them how to code. You know, if you try to teach them how to code at early age, it may be easier. But I also want to relate uh, this question of yours, Monk, to the previous one and tell you a little story. You know, uh, this is like uh, going back, I think, 60 years or so, maybe 70 years to Ramanujan. Ramanujan was a mathematician uh, from India that so that was able to make conjectures, major conjectures that sometimes it took years to prove in mathematics. Okay. So one can ask uh, legitimately is will a computer one day be able to make conjectures of that sort? The answer was given two years ago. A colleague of mine, actually my former student, Ido Kamine, wrote a beautiful paper in Nature magazine on the Ramanujan machine. He wrote a code, him and several undergraduate students, all undergraduates, wrote a code that on an ordinary computer could run on a laptop, I think, that can actually come up with conjectures that it takes through mathemat mathematicians, professional mathematicians, sometimes years to prove. And some of them, and they opened the community already, and it's all shared online. And if you read that, and you will see, you'll be amazed. Some of them were already proved. So in other words, AI came up with conjectures just like Ramanujan did. In my opinion, that addresses the previous question, but it's a major one. Here we have artificial intelligence coming up with something that we thought can come only from the human mind. Mm. Uh, very interesting uh, story there. Uh, thank you, Madi. And I think uh, uh, Rando had uh, Rando. Uh, hands up. Yes, please. Yeah, I, uh, I just wanted to, yeah, I, I, I certainly think there's some need and basis for, and I would even agree that any student at Purdue University ought to have some basic knowledge of programming these days. And as we've been discussing the, it's not, it's not what's being programmed. It's the idea of connect, connecting the, 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 whatever the, the problem is, or the question is to the, to the end result and the process of going through, through that in your, in your mind and developing uh, developing software. I mean, I, I, I look over my career and, uh, you know, the days of programming Fortran and, and have had to adapt many times over uh, to different uh, to different languages and to different types of programs. And, you know, if you have that basic programming mindset or uh, knowledge about uh, how uh, how software is uh, developed, I think you uh, you're much more adaptable. And I've, I've had to adapt in, you know, the last 37 years and to this, this day, uh, certainly the things that we have to uh, do have changed. We do a lot in remote sensing and in uh, structural health monitoring. And a lot of that takes, uh, you know, programming of a, diff of a different uh, set in order to be able to uh, make sure that your systems and systems are are working so I I I, I do believe that it's uh, almost fundamental to an education these days. Hmm. Thank you all. By the way, I'm trying to uh, text uh, uh, response back on the chat box as well. Uh, now let me shift gear to ask uh, another question, which is one that uh, administrators, whatever that means, of university uh, need to answer uh, quite a bit, and that is, why well, if the world is going virtual most of the time, let's say, and that's where the margin, the value might be often derived. Should a university still invest heavily in physical facilities for research? Uh, now, just in case there are Purdue faculty wondering what's my answer to that question, my answer is yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't want to scare anyway, uh, anyone on the, uh, on the call right now from Purdue. But let me ask this question to our visiting distinguished uh, faculty here. Uh, what do you think? Well, I think we've already touched on this question. We said that uh, problems come from physics and you test your hypotheses against physics. For, so for example, Einstein's theory of relativity was proven, demonstrated when there was an eclipse and the light from a distant star was bent as it passed. You can't do that. I mean, you can simulate it, but uh, you still have to run out and do an experiment to prove that what you've got is true. And if enough predictions of a theory or of a hypothesis that you don't haven't previously observed are then subsequently observed, they said, okay, that's a law now. So problems come from physics. 
from mechanical systems and proofs come from mechanical systems. You can't do science without them. So mm -hmm. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, certainly there is the uh, ability to falsify. And, uh, you know, how would you falsify without the physical facility? That's, uh, that's part of the answer. Sure. Uh, well, what, what do other panelists think? But so, so it is interesting that it, in my own field of research, the simulation part has become most useful by falsifying hypotheses. And that is because many of them are truly absurd enough that even a low level of simulation would allow you to say that it is not correct. So it, in that sense, I would turn around a little bit okay, and say that we can do the kinds of calculations that will rule out many, many possibilities that experiments could not rule out. And then we can focus the experiments on those that remain. On the issue of whether universities still will require physical space for research, yes, a resolute yes. In my field, without the experiments, you're not going to be able to deal with the physical reality. I, I do have a concern, and that is that, you know, if we say that experimental research takes up space and we say that virtual research does not, for purely budgetary reasons, there may be a preference on the part of certain administrators to actually hire people that do calculations and simulations rather than people that require sophisticated equipment. And that is a, a tendency that we need to resist because in my field and in most others, there is a definite need to maintain that state-of-the-art expertise in experimental research. Yes, well, I assure you that here at Purdue, we continue to invest heavily. In fact, just in hypersonics area alone, uh, over $110 million of University Central internal funding in the past one year devoted to uh, setting up new experimental facilities. And that's just tip of the iceberg and it goes much broader than uh, one area. Uh, so Purdue certainly is not leaving uh, the uh, physical side. And we try to bring the virtual side into the physical in right. education mm -hmm. from virtual labs to uh, programming, not only as a skill, but as a mindset. And we try to bring the best of virtual and the physical and research strength and impact together. Uh, but we're not leaving that behind. We're not going just with the flow of the fashion or purely because of uh, financial reasons. Uh, it is true. Some of the faculty experimentalist startup package can be quite hefty. It's like yeah. pulling teeth. You know, it's, it pains me to do it. But you've got to do the right thing and invest. Marty, please. So several things. First of all, not everything can be simulated. At least today, on classical computers, there are many, many things that cannot be simulated. So for this, uh, we have this, what we call quantum simulators, where what you do, actually, you create a physical system of called atoms or called molecules of something like this, and then you set up the experiment, the, the potential, and you set up the initial conditions, and you let it run multiple times and take the data. And the ensemble average or the expectation value is the result what a, a computer that would one day be powerful enough to give you. Okay, so on that part, we have no choice. We have to do quantum simulators. But even for classical simulators, I have an opinion. Actually, I have a whole talk about this that explains why they are so important. In principle, one can say, look, there are some classical things that I could simulate. Why do I need experiments? And the answer is that when you do a, when you do a, a a simulation, what you have is an equation, some dynamic equation, some boundary conditions, some initial conditions, and everything is in your starting point, and then you let it run. And let's say the computer can solve it. But when you do an experiment, what you're trying to do, actually, you're trying to, to take a system, a, phys a real physical system, isolate it from the rest of the world, and just try to address a particular issue, a particular model. Okay. Now, in, in learning how to isolate that system from the rest of the world, you learn a lot of things and you learn a lot of, you come up with a lot of ideas about your own system and about things, additional effects that were not initially included. And in addition to that, you can never really see, uh, isolate your system or any system completely from the external world and there are always surprises. And I gave actually a talk about this, a colloquium at Purdue in the summer and how exactly from this kind of view that we must do experiments came a whole new idea that lately in the last uh, few months went already to the industry and there's already there are several companies working on that and maybe one day it will succeed so that started off as a, as a, a simulator and ended up with technology 
So I strongly believe, Monk, that you are doing the absolutely right thing. You have to invest in experimental systems. There is no replacement. Yes. Well, you know, I think we are, are singing to the same choir here. Uh, but indeed, you know, uh, here at Purdue, we believe that uh, we have to pay attention to the power of what we code, but we're not going to leave behind what we touch. Uh, in particular, uh, we believe that what we code will be more valuable, uh, if at all possible, in some cases not, as you just highlighted, Marty, but even when it is completely doable, it will become better, more valuable, sharper, Absolutely. more differentiated if you put it together with the what we touch part. And that's why, you know, we continue to invest in uh, Burke Nanotechnology Center for the tiny ones, uh, the Bowen Lab, which is five story building. You can slide into this building to do earthquake study. That's why we have uh, tremendous investment in Aero Astro, including hypersonics. That's why we are building resilient habitat on the moon with uh, a uh, experimental test bed here. Uh, and that's why we have the world's largest indoor outdoor Jung Dome. Uh, by any university at our airport. So uh, the list goes on. Now, um, I want to quickly, uh, remaining few minutes, and I know that there are great interactions on the um, chat box. Uh, if we don't get there, uh, my apologies. But I, I do uh, have the urge to ask a question. Maybe there's a, like a quick answer, thoughts from each of you. The, here in the Midwest, and uh, now it's not just Purdue, it's also Michigan, there's Illinois, and uh, here in the Midwest, manufacturing is there a hope and this is uh not just research education it's also university as an economic engine as an innovation engine is there hope that technology may rewrite manufacturing industries equations so that we can bring industry 4.0 back here to the midwest Well, there's an additive manufacturing um, and new technology that uh, could be applied here in the Midwest. I mean, yes, additive is indeed, uh, you know, additive slash digital slash uh, uh, other uh, type of process innovations, in addition to material innovations, you know, uh, may indeed uh, rewrite the economic equation whereby innovation is more valuable than labor, right? Uh, in which case then we might be able to reshore some of those manufacturing jobs uh, back to this part of the country uh, in particular, or to any part of this country. I wonder if panelists have any thoughts, suggestion that what particular industry sector or what particular manufacturing innovation may help uh, us to rejuvenize a new kind of manufacturing uh, in the U.S., in particular in the Midwest. So not, not being from the Midwest and not being in the kinds of industries that perhaps are considered to be high technology, uh, I, I just like to point out that, um, that things are cyclic in nature and that um, it is difficult to make predictions, right, especially about the future. <laughs> um, and uh, that, for example, in my area, the chemical industry was disappearing from the U.S. If you look now at the Gulf Coast, uh, you will not recognize that prediction anywhere. And that came from the unexpected technology of fracturing and the shale gas evolution. That today, you know, clean energy technology, you know, photovoltaics, fuel cells, batteries, and so on, um, for the most part, we're subcontracted through globalization and for the sake of immediate profits. And we're recognizing the tenuous nature of many of those links through the geopolitical issues that we're dealing with right now. And those will return and they will return with better technology, requiring more specialized expertise in order to do it. it it's not going to destroy the work, it's going to create work. Uh, and it's going to bring it back. And I think uh, we should prepare for the, side, for the fact that many of this disappearance and reappearance in general in the US and elsewhere is cyclic and it will come back and it will come back unpredictably. And we need to have this insurance policy to make sure that we accept it back into our economy, whether it is in the Midwest or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, in, well yes, Marty, please. I may, I come from a small country that is called the startup nation. I think the secret is right there. In other words, 
if you think about uh, about uh, uh, work labor, and then you will always there will always be countries where they will do what you want to do for cheap labor. There will always be countries like that, and they will. And the U.S. as a country that pays that uh, you know manpower costs a lot of money. There, you can't fight it. You can't really start putting all kinds of customs on taxes and so forth. The only way to fight it is through innovation. That's the secret. In other words, the only way to do that is to come up with new ideas in all kinds of things, not only software, in all kinds of things. And what you need to do is actually what Monk, you are doing already. You have to bring in the, the industry, especially the high-tech industry, not only the software, but all, all kinds of them, to be near the university. This is really the hope, because then the interaction with them, between them will create knowledge, will create new ideas. Eventually, manufacturing part of it will be, will be done somewhere else, maybe in Malaysia or Indonesia. You can't fight it. You have to create the knowledge, the innovation. Yeah, well, very well said. It is that uh, innovation power uh, that changes the constraint set rather than struggling within the constraint set. You know, I, I do optimization for wireless networks, and uh, if you are dealing with a distributed optimization problem, uh, well, ideally, you should ask yourself, why can't I just uh, you know, rewrite the constraint set uh, to get to, 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 get to a, a very different problem in the first place? Uh, well, you know, I just want to quickly respond back to the uh, uh, Mananujan uh, paper there. That's very interesting. Thanks for sharing the link. Uh, and this reminds me of a conversation uh, with Eric Schmidt years ago when I was at another institution hosting a panel with him. Uh, and uh, I said, this is years ago, I said, Google Translator, I said, you know, Eric, and he was still the executive chairman of uh, Alphabet at that time. Uh, you know, this Google Translator doesn't quite work. Uh, you know, I put in some words in there. If it's a user manual, you know, how to turn on the TV, it probably works. But otherwise, as I put in a poem from a East Asian language and try to get it to English, and it's not poetic. Now, Eric had a very uh, witty and I think telling uh, answer, uh, and that is a very simple answer. Uh, Nobody cares, not, well, he said it in a milder way, but roughly, uh, nobody cares enough about poem translations to give me enough data point. Had you given me enough data point, I would have made it very poetic. Uh, so now, <laughs> it's hard to refute that, and maybe it's not refutable. Uh, now, so to what degree will human creativity or artistic taste or sense of humor and so on be uh, indeed replicable by codes? Um, well, I don't know, but uh, I do want to thank all of you for a really intellectually vibrant conversation. We only have one hour, wish we have more. We will have more in the coming years. And I want to thank all those who are uh, chatting in the chat box in real time. Uh, sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. And uh, to all five New Armstrong distinguished visiting professors to Purdue Engineering, we hope to see you a lot here in West Lafayette. Uh, not only vir virtually as we're doing this hour, but physically in person. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank Take you. care. See you next time. Bye bye. bye, -bye.